Welcome to Faith Point, the podcast ministry of First Southern Baptist Church of Prescott Valley with Senior Pastor Carol Eldreth. Our goal is to allow our faith to intersect with real life. So let's join Pastor Carol today as he shares with us from God's Word. Gracious Father, what a wonderful God you are. We are, we are amazed at your love for us. We're amazed at the sacrifice that you made that we might be here today, that we might have eternal life. We are amazed at the Spirit who fills our hearts and fills this place, who gives us wisdom, who gives us grace, who speaks comfort and joy into our lives. Father, today, every one of us has issues in our lives. It just comes with living. Some are a little less than others today. Some are more than others today. Father, you know each of them. And so we pray, Father, that you would speak into each of those issues in our lives today, that you might bring hope, that you might give peace, that your love would be preeminent in all that we would do. So, Father, meet us this morning around your word. Speak to our hearts through your spirit. Allow Jesus to be glorified in magnificent ways today in our lives. We pray these things in Christ's name. I'm going to call your attention to the screen as we finish that prayer. love of God. Last week, beginning of Advent, we talked about hope. All of these, all these prophecies about the coming of a Messiah promised hope. They were hope-filled, and today they're still hope-filled as we think about his second coming. Today, we think about love. We think about that love of God that sent Jesus Christ into the world who actually lived out that sermon that we can preach today, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, he loved you and me, that he gave his only begotten son, his one and only son, Jesus Christ, to die in our place. And it all came to a resounding conclusion. It began to come to this marvelous conclusion once upon a time in Bethlehem. We're talking about once a time, on time in Bethlehem here for several weeks. We are, we are, we've looked at a couple of weeks now, and we've, we've looked at some things that have happened. Uh, at this point, we have seen a young woman, a young teenager, Mary, who one day has a visit from an angel, Gabriel, and he says to her, in the midst of all she's doing, he stops her and he says, You are highly favored because you're going to conceive and bear a child. And he's going to be the son of the Most High. And like any reasonable person, she said, I don't understand how that can be because I'm a virgin. And he said that this child is going to be conceived of the Holy Spirit. And she said, okay, then I'm the Lord's servant. Let it be as you say. She was already engaged. She was not just engaged. She was betrothed to a man. But they weren't married yet. They weren't living together yet. And pretty soon, because she had conceived by the Holy Spirit, it became obvious, remember, that she was pregnant. And Joseph wasn't sure what to do about that. He saw all of his hopes and dreams being crushed before him. He, didn't, he, he wasn't sure how he would move forward. What he did know was that, that, that either he or Mary or both of them would be ostracized if not put to death because of this. And so the only thing he could think of to do 
was to put Mary away privately, to divorce her privately, and let her go off to some other region to live, maybe with some relatives, and raise that child. And everybody would think that he was the father, that they had begun to sleep together before they were married. But he was willing to do that. And then, in a dream, an angel comes to him. And he says, you know, Joseph, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife because this child has been conceived by the Holy Spirit. And he is going to be the Savior of the world. You can go ahead and go through with your marriage. And he did something. He moved in courageous obedience. You know, when sometimes being obedient takes a lot of courage, and that one took more courage than, than I don't think we can even begin to imagine. That he would believe that this young lady, that he had put all of his hopes and dreams into, really was still a virgin and had conceived by the Holy Spirit. And he was willing to take whatever the flack was going to be and stand by her. And then... About that same time, there were some magi far away to the east in Persia. They were astronomers, they were philosophers, they were scientists, they were mathematicians. And they had been studying the constellations and they'd seen something unusual in the constellations that told them that there was going to be this one who was going to be born, the Messiah, the King. And they did the only reasonable thing they could think of. They packed up a whole bunch of stuff and they started out on a caravan journey because it seemed to be leading them to this out-of-the-way little tiny place of the Roman Empire called Judea. They'd never been there before, but they said that's where those constellations, that's where the star is leading us. And so they started that journey. It was a months-long journey. It was, it, was, it was maybe as long as a year. It was a cross-desert. It was not an easy journey, but they started to make that journey. And so we saw that happening. And about that same time, way over to the, to the west in, 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 in Rome, we have Caesar Augustus, remember, who decides that, that he needs to tax the whole world. And to do that, he needs to take a census. And so, so for all the known world, the Roman Empire, he said everybody has to return where? To the city of their birth. All the men do, and they have to register there. And then I can tax you, and for the young men, I can conscript you into my armies if I want to. Because I'll know who you are and where you are. And so, for most people, that wasn't a very big deal. But for Mary and Joseph, it was somewhat of a big deal because they were living in Nazareth. Remember, and Nazareth was 80 miles north of Bethlehem. Why was that a big deal? Because they had to make that journey. But it was important that they follow the law, and so they made decision to do that. Now, God had already said that Nazareth was not the place where the Messiah was going to come from. He was not going to, he would be known as a Nazarene, but he was not going to be born there. And so, so because of that, um, they needed to go somewhere else. Uh, in, my, in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, a couple weeks ago, we looked at this verse. I actually looked at it again this morning because it was in my, my reading um, going through the book of Micah right now. Uh, it says, But you, Bethlehem, uh, Epaphrath, uh, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will ru <clears throat> be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. And so... For God, it was no big deal to make it work out so that Mary and Joseph, Mary who is now carrying in her belly this infant child, Jesus, to get them to Bethlehem at the right time. And so from the north, Mary and Joseph are heading south from Nazareth to Bethlehem. From the east, heading west, are the Magi heading toward Bethlehem. And God is working it all out. As we continue our story, 
let's think a little bit about what's going on in Bethlehem at that time. Now, normally, I've told you that there were about, a, historians tell us about a thousand people who lived in Bethlehem at that time. But these weren't normal times. Because now, Caesar has made his proclamation. That means that everybody's on the move someplace, it seems. And so it appears that Bethlehem's population has just multiplied, it's just grown. And so at this point, uh, we have Mary and Joseph who are showing up, and they need a place to stay, but there is no room for them. There's no place for them to stay. And, and so we know the story. We know how that goes. They go looking for that place to stay. They go to an inn. The innkeeper says, hey, there's no place. They're all, you know, I'm booked. And I, you know, I call the other inns, but I think they're all booked too. And, and I don't know where you're going to go. And so maybe they found a place to stay there in a stable. Because most inns would have a stable because you had to have some place to put your animals that you're traveling with, whether it's a donkey or a camel or, or, or whatever it might be that you had. And so you had to have some place to, to, to put them in a stall. So, so it might have been there. It might have been maybe it was somebody's house and their, their little their little stable that they had. But somewhere it was a place that was private, gave a little bit of privacy, gave them a little bit of time that they would need. And in the midst of this, Mary, who's very pregnant by now, is in labor. And now it's time. And so in some out-of-the-way cave, or shed or stall with animals all around and lots of hay, Mary gives birth. Think about that. The King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. Bible says He is the one who created everything. Jesus is the one who spoke everything that we can conceive of into existence. And yet, He entered into our existence as this frail, fragile little baby in a place where animals are kept and put into a trough, a feeding trough. That's what a cradle was. It was just a little feeding trough, this time filled with a lot of hay to provide a little bit of comfort. Well, can you think of a more inauspicious beginning than that? The Nicene Creed, a creed that's been around for a long, long time that talks about who we, what we believe as Christians and, and what's important, things that are of most importance. Look what it says. It says, talking about Jesus Christ, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. Talking about how great and powerful Jesus Christ is. And then the Bible tells us that this God who is almighty, who is all-powerful, who is omniscient, who created everything, humbled himself in the most amazing way. He said, but he made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men, Philippians 2.7. And it was in that rustic stable of a room that the king of kings came into our world as a poor, helpless child. Think about that. His mother is this young teenager. Can you imagine how scared she must have been. This was not how Mary and Joseph thought they would begin married life. And they weren't even married yet. This was not their plan. And Joseph, I imagine, was just as perplexed and afraid as well. What are they going to do? How are they going to live? 
What are people going to think about this? And so all they could do was take this little child and they wrapped him in swaddling clothes, the Bible says. Swaddling clothes are just strips of linen cloth that they wrapped around him, kind of like a mummy. You know, we used to say that we wrapped our kids up like a burrito, you know, in a, in, in a blanket, but they didn't, they didn't have blankets. They, they didn't have, they couldn't afford blankets probably. So they just wrapped him up in strips of cloth because they needed to give him that comfort and that warmth and to hold his little fragile arms close to his body, just like we do today with our little ones. And they laid him there in the manger. But first of all, can you see the picture of Mary holding Jesus in her arms? We sing, the little Lord Jesus, no crying he made. You know what? It's, it's poetic, but I think it's completely false. <laughs> he better have cried. You don't cry, you're probably not going to live. If you don't cry, today the doctor swats you in the rear to make sure that you take in a breath. I think he cried like every other baby cries, probably echoed through all the neighborhood, through all of those inns and all those houses where everybody was asleep, never giving attention to a young couple that needed desperately a place to stay. And Jesus cried. And they laid him in that manger. That's such a Christmas word to us today, but it was a feeding trough. Several hundred yards away, maybe a mile or two, out on the hillsides there of Bethlehem, and it's a beautiful place. It's just rolling hills. It's, I mean, it's just like driving through our, our area here that we live in. Well, you see grasslands and rolling hills. That was Bethlehem. And it is today, still. And so just beyond the city limits somewhere, a scattered handful of shepherds were watching their flocks by night. Now, shepherds were particularly looked down upon in society, Jesus' day. They were, they were the so-called unsophisticated those who were the sophisticated those who were the respectable crowd um, they didn't want anything to do with the shepherds um, the shepherds some of them were teenage boys who who didn't have an option of pursuing you know more prestigious line of work and so they were there for the first time others were were older men who had made a lifetime of this and they understood their place in society they weren't a part of mainstream society. They weren't able to participate in community activities uh, like those people who had a nine-to-five job. They weren't able to do a lot of the things, including even worship on the Sabbath, like those who lived in town. But the Bible says... The role of shepherd is similar to our relationship with God. It's not the role of the people in town who were the well-respected. It was the shepherds that God says, that's the kind of relationship that I have with my people. Isaiah compared God to a shepherd. In Isaiah chapter 40, verse 11, he says, He tends his flocks like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. And then we also remember that King David, before he was king, was a shepherd boy. He kept his father's flocks. And he learned how to be a good shepherd. It was an interesting thing because as he learned how to care for and protect his father's flocks, those lessons prepared him for the challenges of facing Goliath. They prepared him for the challenges of later leading the kingdom of Judah. And then near the end of his life, he wrote in Psalm 23, 1, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. 
He understood what it was to have the Lord as your shepherd. And then, of course, Jesus referred to himself in that very role. In the Gospel of John, in John 10, 14, he said, I am the good shepherd. He said, I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. They know me. One of the things that, that, that our missionary, uh, Mark Bennett, says is that, that he tries to learn the names of all these homeless people because nobody, and I never thought about this, if you're homeless, nobody knows your name and nobody cares what your name is. And so as he encounters these people, he learns their names and calls them by name. And they respond to that. Because nobody's calling them by name. How wonderful is it that Jesus Christ, our shepherd, knows our names. And he calls us by name. We are not just a faceless, of, of someone, in, a faceless person in a crowd to Jesus Christ. He knows us. He knows our name. And so we have this, these shepherds who, who are emulating who Jesus Christ was going to become because God has always looked kindly upon those whose life's work is to provide care and nurture and protection. It was no surprise that, that on this most holy of nights that he chose a handful of shepherds to be the first to hear the news. And, and can you imagine what happened as each one heard that, uh, what was going on uh, late in the night uh, they were dotted across the countryside there, and there appeared to them this angel. I don't think they were all together. They weren't just staying in a bunch. Their, their, their sheep would have been all over. They would have to be close to their sheep. And so it's kind of like watching, I just kind of think it's a lot like watching fireworks, and you're watching it over here on this side of town, you're watching on that side of town, but you're all seeing the same thing. And so they're all over that hillside, and they're watching. All of a sudden, there's this angel up there in the air, and he's talking to them, and, and they could hear it. And he said in Luke chapter 2, verses 10 through 12, do not be afraid. I bring you good news, a great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord, and this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger and then suddenly it was not just one angel speaking to them but it was a whole choir of angels that were there and they began to sing and they sang this song glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to men with whom his favor rests and the shepherds did what they came running together did you see that did you hear that Wow, wasn't that amazing? I can't believe what just happened. Was that, a shed, was that an angel? Was that a choir of angels? Can you believe what they just said? And, and so they began to get together. I don't know how many was in the group. It was a half a dozen. Maybe it was more. And, and they weren't sure what to do. Except that they said, let's go find this child in Bethlehem. Now, in this whole story, the shepherds were never going to be the problem. They were not going to be the problem. You know who the problem was going to be? The sheep. It was going to be the sheep. That's interesting. In, in all nativity stories, in all the nativity scenes that you by in all the nativity stories at church how many wise men are there there are three wise men we don't know if there were three wise men they've been given names but the bible doesn't give their names it could have been three it could have been 12 it could have been 24 we don't know we'll find out next week maybe. But I know, I think I know why we settled with three. Because when you get everybody up here for a, for a, a nativity scene, there's really only room for about three guys. <laughs> they just don't have room for any more than that. 
The same thing with your little nativity scene at home. If there was a dozen of them, you said, what am I going to do with number four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and twelve? You have to buy a new table to put them on, a bigger table. So three was a convenient answer. Nativity scenes are interesting. Nativity plays are interesting. Let me stop the narrative right now and just kind of let you visualize what could have happened that night. This actually is a church. It's a Baptist church in the Nashville, Tennessee area two years ago. Let's watch the screen. Tackler, that's what he's doing, yeah. <laughs> the sheep were going to be the problem. So I think the shepherds just left them. They had been faithful. They were good shepherds. But all of a sudden, they had a chance to go see this one who'd been promised, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And he was in Bethlehem. And so they left the sheep, and they went to find Jesus. But it wouldn't be long before these shepherd boys would leave. And soon there would be other visitors. Those magi, those wise men who were coming from the east. But we'll get to that next Sunday. That's where we're going to leave our story today. I want you to think, though, about one thing that was going on. The Bible says that as... Mary listened to what the shepherds were saying about their encounter with the angel choir, that she did what? It says in Luke chapter 2, verse 19, she treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. She said, this is, this is way outside of my comfort zone here. I, I don't know exactly what I signed up for. But I'm willing to let God be God in my life, and so that's okay. And there's so many scenes in this Christmas story that's, that, that are, are just iconic, and they're just, they just kind of come to mind when we think about Christmas. But that story, that scene of, of Mary and Joseph with the baby and maybe with some shepherds around, is just, that just speaks to my heart. That, that when I think of Christmas, that's what I think of. Um, because, you know, I think that Mary was there probably thinking about those very, that very first encounter with the angel Gabriel as he told her that, that, that she was going to be the mother of the Messiah. And she was going to conceive by the Holy Spirit. And, and I think that she's pondering and thinking about the words that, that the angel spoke then later on to Joseph in a dream, saying, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife. Go ahead and go through with the marriage. And I think that there was that time with, in, in, that we talked about last week when she was in Zechariah and Elizabeth's home, Elizabeth, her cousin, her aunt, and, and she had confirmed that, that this was the Messiah that she was carrying through the Holy Spirit. And then there was that journey of 80 miles through desert uh, to get down from Nazareth to Galilee, uh, into uh, Nazareth up in Galilee, down into Bethlehem in Judea. And it was rugged terrain, and, and yet they were following this, this, this 
this command to show up in Bethlehem. And then there were the shepherd boys talking about hearing the angels sing. So much happened. So much had gone on in a nine-month period. She knew the journey yet had just begun. She wasn't sure where it was going to take her. I think she treasured these events in her heart. I wonder if she spoke those words of, of Luke chapter 1 again in verses 46 and 47 and verse 49. We call it the Magnificent Mary's, Mary's Song about what God is doing in her life. We read part of it last week. My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. For he is mighty and hath done to me great things, and holy is his name. And Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Because there was no room in the inn, and he was wrapped in swaddling clothes, and he was placed in a manger, and there he spent that first holy night with his mother and father. But that's not where the story ends. Next week, we're going to take the story a little further. In the remainder of time that I have this morning, I just want to, just want to talk about some of the things that, that maybe we need to extrapolate from this story things that we can learn and apply to our lives I want to highlight some lessons to learn this morning primarily what we see in these events is that God doesn't do things the way that most people would expect him to do them he just doesn't he just never has and and that's who he is. He says, I'm going to do things the way I've decided that I'm going to do them. And he works according to his standard, not ours. And his standard often involves coloring outside the lines. He said, I know where the lines are, but I don't have to color in them if I don't want to. You know, way too often, we try to put God inside of a box, don't we? We say, God... This is how I want you to be. This is how I want you to operate. And this, is I, this is who I expect you to do, what I expect you to do. And so I'm going to put you in this box. And please stay there in that box and, and act the way I want you to act and, and do the things that I ask you to do. Give me what I want and, and just be in that box for me. And you know what we find out? That, that when we try to put God in a box, ultimately we end up with an empty box, don't we? Because God is not going to be boxed in. God is not going to be put in our box. It just is not going to happen. It doesn't happen that way. Um, God works in ways that we don't often expect, and usually it is outside the lines of conventional thinking. He just says, I know what the world thinks, I know what you want, but I'm going to do what is right and what is by my plan. So let me share with you three outside the lines lessons in the Christmas story that we can learn. First of all, God makes himself known to all who seek him. He makes himself known to all who seek him. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what your background may be. In today's story, the wise men who have yet to complete the journey that they begun several months before, a journey which covered that distance of at least a thousand miles across this, this very harsh desert. Um, and you know what ultimately happens. What ultimately happens is they find Mary and Joseph and Jesus, and they worship him as he deserves to be worshipped. And we're going to see that next week. But today, the point I want to make on the outside of the lines element of their role in the story is this, that it's strange that these men who were not Jewish, who did not live in Judea, um, who did not even have the Old Testament, apparently, because they didn't know where he was going to be born. They never heard of the book of Micah, chapter 5, verse 2. They didn't know they had to come and ask. These stargazing priests from another religion would be seeking so intently this revelation from God when just seven, six or seven miles away, in the city of Jerusalem, this, this major city in the world where there are untold numbers of priests and Levites, experts in the law, experts in the word of God, had no idea that the Messiah 
had just come six miles away. These magi saw the stars from a thousand miles away and followed it. Why didn't these Jewish religious leaders see the star? It was right there. Either they didn't see it or they didn't recognize it for what it was. I don't know why. I think they didn't recognize it or see it for what it was because they weren't looking for the Messiah. They spoke the words about it. They could talk the good talk, but they weren't doing it. They really weren't concerned about the Messiah coming. You know what they were doing? They were trying to stay on the good side of King Herod. They wanted to be on his good side because he had the power. Then these non-Jewish followers of another religion showed up to say, hey, where's the king of the Jews? We want to worship him. You know, God knows the difference, friends, between those who are toying with religion and those who sincerely know him. Don't kid yourself. If you're toying with religion today, he knows. If you're toying with this thing called Christianity, he knows. If you're toying with faith, he knows. But if you're honestly seeking, if you're honestly searching, then he is going to help you find what you're looking for. In 1 Chronicles chapter 28, verse 9, we read the following. For the Lord searches every heart and understands every motive behind the thoughts. If you seek him, he will be found by you. Now, today... I don't know everybody in here all that well. There's some people that I've just barely met. Maybe just don't even know your name yet because you just walked in today for the first time. And, and you may have, some of you may have doubts about some aspect of our faith. You know, there may be some things about quote-unquote religion that cause you to question. But I can promise you this, that, that if in the midst of your uncertainties, you are seeking to discover the presence of the one true God. He will make himself known to you. Because in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, the writer of Hebrews says, he, talking about Jesus Christ and God, rewards those who earnestly seek him. You say, God, I don't know everything about, about Christianity. I don't know everything what it means to be a Christian, but I want to find Jesus Christ. I want to know him a savior, then he says you will find him. He will make himself known to you. The Christian life is not about church membership. It is not about repeating religious rituals. It's not even acknowledging the right set of facts. It is about seeking and finding and following the only begotten Son of God. And wherever you are today, you can begin that journey. God doesn't ask us to be religious in the sense that some might suppose, he simply asked us to seek him. Another outside of the lines lesson from the Christmas story. God gives first class preference to the so-called second class. First class preference to the second class. I mentioned earlier how the shepherds were considered to be on the lower rung of the social ladder uh, often, you know, dismissed kind of a wave of the hand. No, they're not part of us. They don't really count. We don't need them around. And yet, on that holy night, as all the respectable people slept in their beds, an expectant mother on the threshold of labor that nobody wanted to notice, except nomadic hired hands watching their sheep at night. And God remembered them. The second class of the second class. Many considered the shepherds to be on the periphery of society. They just barely counted. But you know what? With God, there's no periphery. There is absolutely no periphery. 
There is no outsider. There is no second class. He reaches beyond the boundaries and he invites everyone to find their place in the center of his love. Maybe this morning there's some reasons why you think you're part of the periphery. Maybe it's because of things that happened in your past. Maybe it's because of the labels that other people placed on you. Much like the young man from Japan that said, you know, I was five years old, my parents tried to drown me in the ocean. How much further on the periphery could you get? But not in God's world. I want you to know that you are the one Jesus came to seek and to save and to call his own. You are. And the early church was not built on the influence of civic leaders and high-ranking officials. You know what it was built on? It was built on the so-called second class, those who were on the periphery, those who were often overlooked by society. Those are the people that built the church. The, built, the church is built on them. There is no second class in God's economy. In Galatians 3.28, it says, There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And then thirdly, God's plan circumvents conventional wisdom. It often does. It often circumvents conventional wisdom. God's plan was that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem and and so naturally, he was going to choose a prestigious family from Bethlehem to raise this child. Um, it would, he would get a, a home that would be befitting of a king. He would get the education that he would need. Uh, he, would, he, would have, he would rub shoulders with the influential people, all the right people. And he would make a name for himself from the very start. Because obviously, such a leader as the Messiah, the king of kings, would certainly be a man of political influence and military power. That would just make sense, wouldn't it? Well, it makes sense to everyone but God. That's not God's plan. He chose instead for a child to be born to a woman who was engaged but not married, to a working class man uh, living, a poor, living in a poor village in the nation's most backward region in Nazareth. And this child was born to them. And then he chose for this child to grow up, not surrounded by power and affluence, but in a simple home, learning a simple trade among simple people. In Luke chapter 2, verse 52, Luke says, that he spent his formative years growing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. That was God's plan. And it was not what anyone expected it to be. Mary and Joseph's part in the plan was simply to say, yes, I am the Lord's servant and I am willing to do what he asked me to do. And from there, God guided each of their steps. God's plan often moves us along a path that we don't expect. What he wants most from you and from me is a willingness to seek him, a desire to hear his voice, and a heart prepared to obey. The same things we saw in Mary and Joseph. He looks for in, in us. And when we do that, you know what's going to happen? You're going to have a life that's anything but conventional. God's going to do some amazing things in your life, and he's going to lead you every step of the way, but he's going to call you many times to color outside of the lines. And that's okay. And then you too, like Mary, will often find yourself reflecting on God's goodness and treasuring all that he brings to pass in your life. And you'll be saying, like she did, for the Mighty One has done great things in me, holy is his name. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for joining us today for Faith Point. Reach us online at firstsouthernpv.org or stop by to worship with us if you are in the Prescott Valley area. May God richly bless you today as you allow your faith to intersect with your life.